Well, it's definitely a pleasure to be here. It's a gorgeous day here in Michigan, so it's, uh, it's not snowing, which is good as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's also a very fitting place to be here in the Gerald Ford Presidential Library. Uh, President Ford was a, a naval officer. He has very strong naval ties, and so it, it, it's very uh, nice to be in this environment. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is about the Navy's impending shift to a new electrical systems architecture. Now, you don't make shifts like this just on a whim or because technology allows you to go to do it. You have to do it because the world around you is changing. You know, the needs of the Navy are changing, and the existing way of doing business isn't going to uh, work anymore. And what I'm going to show you today is, is what's driving this change, why today's systems aren't going to work anymore, and why we believe medium voltage DC is the right way to do it, and, and some properties of that. So hopefully at the end of this, uh, you know, roughly an hour, well, uh, you'll be somewhat convinced that the Navy's on the right path, or you'll let me know where I've screwed up, and you can uh, help me uh, steer me into the right direction. So for setting the scene, this comes from the report from Congress. This is the annual 30-year shipbuilding plan that we, the Navy puts out every year, and it changes every year, so it's a very stable document. But it's a... But basically, in, in FY 2030, which you think is a long time from now, but in the world of R&D, it's tomorrow, the Department of the Navy plans to start building an affordable, follow-on, multi-mission, mid-sized future service combatant to replace the Flight 2A DDG-51s that will begin to reach their end of their service life in uh, FY 2040. So we have a little bit of time to go do that, but what does that mean? But some of the big differences that they go on and saying is that they want in this one is that the Navy's right now been investing in a lot of advanced weapon systems. These are electric weapon systems. Things like high energy, you know, that are high energy rail gun, lasers, sensors like uh, you know, high powered, uh, you know, high powered radars. We also have uh, electronic warfare systems. And we'll see all this in the next few slides. But what's happening is, is that you could put all of these things on a ship of today's architecture, but the amount of additional things like energy storage and a lot of buffering and the, and the amount of other stuff you'd have to hang on the system to make it work, you, it would be a ship that would be very large. And part of the affordable part of it is they're telling us we really would like it to be less than 10,000 tons. And oh, by the way, if you can make it closer to 7,000 tons, we'd really like it a lot better. And what we know is that every study that we've done to date where we've tried to do this, to add both the high energy weapon systems and then also the, the flexibility, the modularity and the flexibility aspects, we're, have all shown that we're gonna be in about a 10,000 or larger ship. I, think, I don't think you've seen anything else either, but it's, we can't do it with what we know today. That's the bottom line, we can't, what, the, what our uh, customer, which is the, the Chief of Naval Operations, is telling us what they want. We cannot do it using today's technology and the 60 hertz systems that we, uh, we have traditionally employed have been very successful the last hundred years. So we have to go to something different. But we don't want to do this haphazardly as well because uh, there's that affordable part as well. We also got to make sure that what we do doesn't cost a lot of money. And it's so easy to say, oh yeah, yeah, technically you can do it. And I'm convinced technically we can do a lot of things. It just kind of technically do it affordably. And that becomes the challenge. So part of this, what's driving us in this world, okay, is that increasing electric power demands. This is the USS Trenton. And many of you have probably seen this before. That is the very first ship that the US Navy had that had an electrical power system. They use it for lighting systems. And what's happening is the, the growth has just been uh, tremendously growing uh, as we add solid state lasers, rail guns, free electron lasers in the future. Why is the Navy going to these new weapons? So that's a big question. Why? I mean, it, there's, you know, uh, it, ha it should be fulfilling a need. Why are we doing it? The big reason really comes down to it is, once again, going back to that, that thing, affordability. 
yes, the rail gun is anticipated to cost a lot to develop and it'll actually be more expensive than a uh, five inch gun. But when you look at what you're trying to accomplish with a rail gun, which is ballistic missile defense, a long range attack, they're, the rounds themselves are considerably cheaper. The problem is right now is we're trying to, uh, uh, that the bullets we're shooting at their bullets cost more than their bullets. We got to get onto the right side of the cost equation. Our bullets have got to be cheaper than their bullets. And the rail gun is one way where we believe, and yeah, that's what the evidence all points to it, is that I can make a cheaper bullet coming out of a rail gun that can shoot down their bullet. And that's one of the big reasons why we're trying to go that way. Because if, if money were not an issue, we would just keep on building better and better missiles that cost more and more, which some people would really like. But we got to get the cost out. It's affordability is what's driving this. So we're willing to invest money now into uh, getting on the right side of that cost curve. And that's what the Navy's doing. But it's got some other interesting aspects from a naval architectural viewpoint too, from an integration. So you got to think of things a little different. You got those challenges, of course, that I have no clue how to power it yet. But so that's a minor detail. But on this, on the. Uh, Safety side, it does enhance stuff. So I don't, you know, if you think of the, uh, of what's the, the vulnerability of a warship, one of its biggest vulnerabilities is its, are the munitions that it has on its ship. And even of that, on the gun side, it's the propellants. You think it's the high explosives part? We actually have more, we're more worried about the propellants than the high explosives. Many times the high explosives are designed to be safe, it's harder to make to do that with the propellant sizes. By eliminating the propellants, we actually cut down the amount of uh, explosives uh, that you have on board the ship because the railgun uses electricity to to uh, accelerate the rounds. We don't use any powder in that sense. Now the warhead itself has tremendously less explosives as well because we're using kinetic energy to do the damage and not chemical energy. And so what we're trying to do is, is that well, the advantage we have in that is that our ships no longer are likely to disappear like the hood did when it got a mass detonation of a magazine. And so a lot of those systems that we put on board a warship today to prevent uh, uh, mass uh, magazine detonation, we don't have to do. We can do things differently. So we can, we can start rethinking how to re-architect, what's the right way of arranging a warship if I don't have to put all this protection on that magazine system. Some other systems, when well, we still have to do some protection, we still have torpedoes and still have other aspects on board, but when we start using the rail gun and some of these other electric weapons, we can rethink how we arrange it, how we design it, and, uh, and really that's gonna be the challenge of folks, both in NAVC, but also we're gonna depend upon the engineers that come out of schools here like Michigan to help us think through what a warship should look like. Because remember, I also gotta get this warship to be more affordable. So how can I use the gain side of what we can do with electric weapons to get the cost out? So if I don't have to put a magazine sprinkler system in, if I don't have to put all the other aspects of armor and those aspects, how can I reap those benefits in making the ship as cheap as possible? Other weapons, solid state laser. You probably have uh, seen there's been a lot of press about the Navy's first uh, you know, test on the Ponce. But you know, as of uh, the integration uh, on the Ponce is, is rather, I would say, crude. It's not well integrated at this point. But uh, at, at some point, we will be integrating it into it, getting these weapons and making them as part of a, integrated into the overall ship uh, design process. And they will help us. They won't do it all. I mean, they, they, they lasers are not the only solution for self-defense, but as part of as a layered defense, they can, they can help you do things that you can't do with conventional weapons. So here's the, the you know, from a power systems viewpoint, here's sort of the problem you run into, is that you got, you know, although the numbers aren't on here, you know, think of these in the megawatt pulse range you know, levels. A lot of ships we're talking about, you know, normally have the entire ship service load is on a couple of megawatts level. Here we're talking about pulses and noise like that that's on the level of, uh, of what a normal ship would see as their steady state load. That's sort of the challenge we have. And why is that bad? Oh, you know, 
that gets reflected back to the prime mover, back to the uh, gas turbines, back to the diesel engines. Their speed governors, their, you know, what they're trying to work on is trying to, is trying to match and follow that. The line inductances, everything else is your, your voltages on your uh, buses are going to be moving all over the place, frequencies are moving all over the place. And so we can't use the same type of you know, 1399, section 300 type uh, interfaces and present them with these kinds of loads because the reality is these loads violate the terms of the interface standard. So if you wanted to, to, uh, to put them on board a ship using today's rule set, they would have to bring their own buffering energy storage. Each one of them would have to bring their own set of batteries or capacitors or rotating machines. And if you want to see what that means, what that looks like on a ship, the, uh, the aircraft carrier, the E-MALS, does that. They are an electric weapon, if you want to call that, because uh, that launches aircraft. The E-MALS adheres to the Navy's standard for power quality on, on their medium voltage AC bus. It also has hundreds of tons of energy storage to make that happen. We can't afford to do that on a 7,000 ton destroyer. So th these are the assets, we gotta do things differently. It's, we know how to technically do it to make it work Aircraft carriers are, are, are doing it, but we don't know how to do it affordably on a small ship. And that then becomes the challenge and reason why we believe medium voltage DC is the right answer. So some of the other aspects, you say we talk about it, the, the uh, operational modes. We may end up having cases where the amount, if you start putting the loads all together at the same time because when you're defending the ship, your electronic warfare, your rail gun, all that's gonna be going on at the same time. And all that together may exceed the generating capacity of your ship all at once. And so we may end up using some type of advanced energy storage to help us. But if you actually read the way the rules are set right now, the, the rules say, hey, if you need energy storage, it's part of the load. That's what our interfaces say. But if you do that, you get big. And so we have to figure out how do we incorporate the energy storage into the power system side of the interface and how do I describe that performance and that language in those interfaces and how do I make it so it's all affordable. And so folks, you know, so one of the things you could say, okay, well, you know what, smart grid, a lot of money is going into smart grid right now. Uh, why not just use all that funding and, and use their solutions. And, and the answer is actually there is a lot of similarity between it, but there are some fundamental differences between shipboard systems and the terrestrial power systems. And they have to be, and you have to be aware of that. And so you can't just blindly take what's used in one domain and just say, hey, I can use it without changing it to another domain. And some of the differences is that on shipboard systems, we have, what, we have less, we call rotational inertia. You know, right now the, uh, the U.S. terrestrial power system and classic power engineering, uh, we have thousands of uh, generators all in parallel. And so all of that, they're all interconnected, so all of that inertia is all connected and in synchronism with each other. We don't have that on board a ship. So as a consequence, the transient uh, behavior is much different, which you have to worry about. Lack of time sales separation. Because of the way that uh, the terrestrial systems operate and the type of equipment they have onto it, we can break up the time scales we call the subtransient, the transient, and the steady state operating conditions. And what happens is the, the I don't want to get into too much electrical engineering here, but uh, basically is that the things that you do and the things you're worried about and in those different three time scales, you can treat them almost separately. So from a controls viewpoint, from an analytical viewpoint, I can look at those three time scales and ignore all the other ones. Either, say, either assume that they're instantaneously, so you can ignore them, or they're so slow that they're constant. And so yeah, you can do it, it simplifies the analysis tremendously in the terrestrial power system. We cannot do that on board ship, because the way that the sizes of our machines are and the way our loads and everything interacts, all those three phenomena all overlap in time scale. Another thing that we do differently is we do uh, power sharing or load sharing instead of load scheduling. 
in a terrestrial power system, and they'll ramp up or down, you know, like a nuclear power plant, you know, based upon the forecast or projections. They'll have some uh, swing generators to help take over, out the instantaneous heat balance or they use energy storage or some other techniques. But what we do is we actively, uh, we actually measure what the load is, essentially, and then we uh, adjust the sharing of power among all our on, uh, online generators. You know, we think of aircraft carriers are being big, and you know, but compared to the terrestrial power system, they're small. You know, when you compare a thousand foot long, uh, roughly aircraft carrier to you know a hundred mile transmission line, aircraft carriers, you know, shipboard systems are small, and so the the electrical characteristics of the transmission lines are not as important. But it also means that things happen faster on board ship too in that sense. Load dynamics, we, you, typically the terrestrial system doesn't look at it very much. Its loads are always small compared to the capacity of the overall terrestrial system. On board ships, especially when we start adding these weapons and, and electric propulsion and uh, you know, e-miles, those other aspects, they're a significant part of our power system and their dynamics matter in how you plan the system. Smaller system, we can do tighter control systems. The other one that we have here that can, uh, has some nuances is on board ship, we use an ungrounded or high impedance grounded system. And uh, that has some nuances on board ship and how we operate and how faults are detected, isolated, and, you know, localized in that sense. It has an impact on corrosion. It has an impact on a number of things, of properties on board ships. A lot of it's not actually all that well understood by the marine community. Terrestrial power systems typically are tightly you know, grounded systems. So, uh, we do the ungrounded high impedance grounded systems on board ships because it allows us to continue, to, it has an operational benefit. It allows us to continue operating when one uh, conductor, when one of the bus gets grounded. So it provides a, a survivability benefit. But it has some other attributes that we have to be worried about in terms of insulation systems and in corrosion and other aspects that we have to really be worried about and understand. And then finally, the physical environment, of course, on board the ship. What I mean by this is, um, you know, naval warships, uh, equipment has to operate at a 45 degree angle, uh, at a roll angle of 45 degrees. Uh, not very many land systems have to do that. And so things like diesel engines, you have to look at, okay, does the do I still keep lubrication going at 45 degrees? Is the oil in the sump going in the right spot? Am I, you know, things leaking? And so it's, it's you can't just take for granted that a diesel engine or is going to, uh, that you, you, that's in a catalog somewhere for a land application is going to actually work on board a ship application, especially a naval application. So these are things you have to worry about in that sense. But also just the other aspects, the high salt environment, the, uh, uh, confined maintenance envelopes, the size, all these issues uh, tends to have you look at electrical equipment a little bit differently than you do uh, you know, for normal terrestrial systems. Okay, so I said earlier before, okay, you know, we want to make the shift to medium voltage and if you want to make a shift of this magnitude and this difference, you should do it for a good reason. And so I'm going to try to uh, have you conveyed to you right now is that why we think medium voltage DC is the right answer. One of the issues you have with AC systems is, we, we talked earlier a little bit about it, is that when two AC uh, generators are in parallel, their rotors are essentially locked in position with relative to one another. They're synchronized and they're kept in that. And that means is that when, uh, when they aren't in synchronism, when they're bouncing back and forth, large amounts of current flow back and forth between them that can actually cause damage. And because when those currents uh, move out, they actually then produce huge torques within those machines. And then those torques can cause damage. And so you, uh, within an AC system, it's very important that it, parallel generators and parallel machines stay in synchronism. And there's a lot of effort in the analysis uh, to talk about how much of a disturbance can, uh, uh, can your power system take and still maintain uh, all of your generators in synchronism. In a DC, and uh, when you start now applying these large loads, like the pulse power load, like the laser loads and those CWIP loads, 
you start running into those issues associated with trying to keep those uh, generators in synchronism in an AC system. When you move to a DC system, you put a rectifier, you convert that AC into a DC, and guess what? You can parallel the generators and you do not need to maintain synchronism anymore. And so all of those issues associated with trying to keep the rotors in synchronism magically go away. That's probably the biggest benefit you get from going to that, uh, you know, going to meeting voltage DC. So a whole, these, a whole challenge area of pulse loads disappears. Because now the only thing I have to match is voltage. I still had to match voltage on the AC side. But the harder part of trying to keep them in, in time synch the synchronism is gone. And in fact, I can take advantage of that. Because what I can, okay, because what I can do is I can now use the energy storage because I'm not keeping keep in, in synchronism. I can actually allow the, the generators to slow down. I can use the stored rotational energy in your generator as a flywheel. In fact, I may even want to put more mass on it to turn it into a flywheel. So I can start rethinking about how I'm building these machines in a way so I can start uh, deciding where I want the energy storage and how I can take an advantage of it. Things that I couldn't do in an AC system. I can now operate those uh, machines at a much higher frequency. One of the other aspects you run into is that the shaft speed determines the frequency of the generator with a, a number of pole pairs but you're, basically you're limited to a 3600 RPM shaft speed in order to get 60 hertz power out. Well, you know what, if I go to 7200 RPM, 10,000 RPM, which tends to make machinery smaller and the generator smaller, I can do that. Frequency goes up, but I'm immediately rectifying it. <coughs> Everything gets smaller. In the end, when you're building machinery, Actually, material matters. <laughs> if I cut the amount of steel, cut the amount of copper that I need in my generators, the cost goes down. So we're trying to move it into the right cost direction to make that happen. Anytime you move to higher frequencies, like for transformers, a higher frequency transformer, it's cheaper because it's smaller. You require less of a cross-section area for a higher frequency to have the same flux, to keep, to basically to be able to transmit the same amount of power across, which is why you can now, you're, you know, the, if you look at what's being used nowadays, this thing here uh, is a, basically a 60 watt, 65 watt transformer, you know, rectifier. 10 years ago, this would have been about three times the size. Today's technology, you can actually make it about a quarter of the size. That's because they're going to higher frequencies they're using a higher frequency type switches to be able to go do that. The other aspect, as you probably know, is that you have to worry about this thing in AC systems called power factor. Power factor, really what it means is that you aren't using the conductors as efficiently as, as you could if you had a purely resistive load. So in a, AC, in a DC system, I don't have to account for power factor. It's a unity power factor. So in other words, uh, power is just the current times the voltage. And an AC system, it's the, the power is the power uh, times the current, or the power is the voltage times the current times the power factor, and the power factor is, uh, is the cosine of the uh, angle between the two sine waves. The other aspect of it is on AC systems is, uh, is that is, is we have traditionally used fault current as the mechanism for doing fault detection, localization, and isolation. And it's a, I mean, the system works, so I'm not gonna knock it in that sense, is, but, it's, but what you're doing is, is that you're using a large amounts of current, uh, which happens when you get a short circuit, to go figure out where the actual problem is, and then you trip the breaker, that's the closest one upstream, and you do that by a timing and current uh, tables. But what's the, the problem with that is, is that there's a lot of energy being, you know, with electrical energy being used in order to, to do that work, and that energy usually causes a lot of damage before it actually is done. And so we have the ability, because uh, in a DC system, you're going to have to use power electronics to go to con uh, create the DC, so any source is going to be power electronics driven. 
And so it has the ability to control the fault current. And so I can use that uh, property to limit the fault current, to limit damage, but it, what it does mean is I've got to use alternate methods to go do the fault detection and isolation. So that's something that's some of the areas that we're still working on right now is to understand that. So there's new ways of doing it. We could do it the old way, but it would be kind of stupid. Uh, partly, one of the, because one of the challenges historically of DC systems has been is that uh, DC circuit breakers, if you do them you know, mechanically where you try to open it up and, and you get a big arc going across it, on an AC circuit breaker, because the voltage goes through a zero, the arc will disappear and you'll have broken the, the connection. Well, when you try opening it on DC, you never, go through a, uh, you never go through a zero crossing. So it just stays there and the arc just keeps on going and going and going. And uh, it takes a long time, it's a lot harder. And so historically people says we don't like DC because we can't have a circuit breaker to go do it. Well, you don't use that mechanism. That's not an appropriate technology for interrupting DC current. So what's happening now is that you want to use the source, you want to turn off the current at the source and use a different mechanism for localizing and isolating the damage. But the, the issue is none of that is standardized yet. I mean, when the AC circuit breakers has 100 years of history and experience in how to go do that. So hopefully I've, uh, I've indicated there's opportunities here. I mean, there's a, uh, there's medium voltage DC is, is not a done deal in a sense that we know everything that there is to do it and we could make it happen and be successful and, and work. And, you know, I could go spec it out and, and be confident that uh, any integrator could go do it. Uh, there are a lot of missing standards. There are a lot of uh, missing design practices. A lot of that uh, still needs to be developed. And, uh, but if we want to get there within the next 10, 15 years, I mean, this is the time now to do it. The technology, I believe, is, is, is really coming there. What's really been driving it, that technology, has been uh, you know, the advances in power electronics is one of the huge enablers of this. Uh, I think we're going to, uh, much like Moore's Law has been occurring on the you know, computers and computer chips, and that's been going on, and that's probably about leveling out now. I think Moore's Law, or the equivalent of that, is essentially happening now in power electronics. May not be at the same 18 months. I don't know what I don't know what it is, but it's essentially happening like that, and you, you can start seeing that. Uh, you know, everything from uh, uh, you know, say the size of these bricks <laughs> is going down every year, and the cost of it's going down, to uh, uh, major uh, variable speed drives drives in general. Their size and cost is going down. Not only the switches, but the capacitors and all the other devices that go along with it. And uh, I believe that we're about to hit a major uh, turning point in that because one of the, the advances that's happening has been in silicon carbide. Silicon carbide is a, uh, electronic devices uh, operate, are much more suitable for high power electronics than silicon. They are they're called a high band, uh, bandwidth, band gap material. They can operate at much higher voltages. They can operate at much higher temperatures and they can switch at much faster speeds. And uh, the big problem for a long time, one of them has been, is that uh, is to be able to produce uh, defect-free wafers. And uh, you know, we started, when the Navy started investing into it about 15, 20 years ago, uh, they, basically they were, you couldn't get a wafer that, had a, that was def sufficiently defect-free to even get a successful device made. Right now, the Silicon you know, Cree is making uh, devices successfully and marketing them using a four-inch wafer. Uh, the big thing that's happening is, is that they're, we're on the verge of getting to a, basically six-inch wafers within the industry. Once the six-inch wafers become of the right size, these are, uh, the six-inch wafer is critical because now the fabrication facilities that are used for silicon for doing custom uh, chip designs, are, they're smaller size than six inches but we can now start manufacturing them in an affordable production facility instead of using the smaller two and four inch fab lines which are usually are, are only small production, very small production runs, more research type oriented systems. So once that happens, the cost of silicon carbide uh, uh, devices are, is going to come down significantly to where there will, will 
Now, where people have been experimenting and using them in niche applications, they'll be starting to be coming into more mainstream applications, and you'll start seeing uh, uh, the cost of being able to do power electronics come way down. And that's going to enable us to do a lot of the stuff in power electronics that before we couldn't do. And that's one of the, I think, one of the bigger enables that's going to turn medium voltage DC into a truly affordable uh, enterprise in that sense. And uh, while I can't say that necessarily that the commercial industry will necessarily go to that way, you know, the commercial marine industry, I see that perhaps happening sometime in the future because things like, uh, you know, potted propulsion and all this will also benefit from that design, but I don't think they'll be necessarily the lead uh, adopters in that. So one of the, the uh, I know this is a pretty poor graphic, but that's the best I could do in PowerPoint, and that's all I'm allowed to do in, in the Navy. But uh, this is, uh, uh, this is, I've been going to a number of the uh, universities in the Electric Ship Research and Development Consortium to talk to them about, okay, if we were to do a medium voltage DC system today, how would we go about doing it? And this is more of a framework in order to talk about, okay, what standards, what work do we have to go do in order to get, to us, get us to a ship in time to meet the, our customers' desires. And, uh, and part of it, it's a talk through, okay, well, what are the opportunities? I mean, I know if I just you know, blindly replace things in an AC system with a DC system, I could probably make one work, but can I take advantages of, it, of uh, medium voltage DC to get the system even smaller and cheaper as, as, as I possibly can in order to get below that 10,000 tons? Because if I do it stupidly, I can still make a successful medium voltage DC system, it's just gonna be too big. So how do, I, how do I take advantage of every possible thing that's out there and in order to get, to, to get that goal of affordability, performance, and uh, getting the size down? So I'm gonna talk through a number of these, these ones, and I know there's acronyms in here, which if you're part of, the, of what's in there, you'll see that. But basically, it's, it's a port and starboard bus. That's where the, the blue lines are. There's bus nodes where you connect into it. And, uh, and it's a zonal type architecture, so you can kind of see where they are. And, and uh, some of the zones have generation in it, some of them don't. Uh, we do conversion, and uh, these are PCMs, are power conversions, and they're used to, to, to take the power from the bus and then convert it down lower. The PCM1As also do some other work. And we'll talk about each one of these components a bit. Uh, so this is the overall uh, process for doing it. And, there's, and as I said, it's, this isn't meant to be any one ship in general. It's meant more to be a talking point for, for, to talk about what the, what the uh, architecture sort of looks like. And we'll talk about what I'd like you to do now is to go through some of these, uh, the, some of the pieces and parts. Now, we didn't start from scratch when, uh, when we came up with that architecture. Uh, believe it or not, uh, well, we, you know, over the last 10 years through the ESRDC, uh, we worked on an IEEE standard called uh, IEEE 1826, which has to do with zonal uh, design. And what we ended up do, doing was we try to implement what was in that standard in a medium, if you were to do medium voltage DC in a zonal system using 1826, what, it would, what would it look like? And, uh, and so what you're gonna see is things that may not sound uh, conceptually uh, like what you would normally think, but uh, in order to align with the way that, uh, that the IEEE standard does, we, we did some things a little differently. One of them is, is that the, may, the large uh, loads and the large generators are, uh, they, aren't in, you know, they aren't considered to be part of an electrical zone in the terms of a ship service zone. So you may have, you said in the, in the last uh, graph, you had about six electrical zones. Generation is viewed from our perspective here in the, in the 1826 viewpoint as a separate overlay zone. Much like uh, if you've been in a large metropolitan area, there are overlay uh, uh, area codes for the phone system. You can kind of think of this as being an overlay zone. So two, two zones could have the same geography on the ship. And it helps from a controls and a power architecture viewpoint. So if you're thinking electrical power, this all makes sense. If you're actually trying to design a ship, it makes no sense at all. And so uh, it's hard to get the two communities to agree on the same lexog, you know, 
same words and how to describe this. But, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit on that aspect of it. And uh, what, there is one thing though, is that, uh, that the, the standard does allow some interzone connect, connectivity. So when we talk about the, the, the structure is, for our, uh, the, the, the graph back on the right is actually directly copied from uh, IEEE 1826. And so the external system is the medium voltage DC bus. So you see two of them, you know, that shows three, but in our case there would be two of them. And, uh, and some backup uh, sources of power would be those inter inner zone connections. And uh, so when I talk to the people at the ESRDC, they are all familiar with 1826, they know exactly what I'm talking about. I know this is a little slightly different audience. So bus nodes, going through this uh, uh, tour of the different components of the medium voltage one. Uh, basically, this is how you segment the main buses, the medium voltage buses, and how you get power off of them. Uh, one of the big aspects of, a bus no of any of these bus nodes is from a zonal architecture perspective, you've got to protect the bus from things that occur downstream. Uh, that's why we have circuit breakers and switch beer, uh, gear, things that's to protect the bus. So if you get damage anywhere else, you want to minimize the damage volume that will take down the bus. So that's why we have the ability to go do th and, uh, and segment portions of potentially uh, damaged components. Now, there's still things that we don't know. Uh, one of them is that we talked about grounding. Grounding is a big issue and we don't, uh, it's not clear where the right spot to ground power systems should be. Uh, it's because, uh, conceivably, as you'll see, uh, some of the components downstream are gonna have energy storage that could backfeed this bus. Usually we ground at the generator, but if you have a lot of energy storage, each energy storage device acts as a generator, and each generator acts as a generator, you could have a lot of grounds, and you could have, start getting ground loops, and it has their own potential issues. And so there's considerable debate going on in, within the power system community on how you do the grounding. We don't know. Multifunction monitors, uh, the other thing we don't know right now is that what's the best way of doing the, the fault detection localization and isolation. Um, one of the models that I think could work, uh, there's, well, okay, there's two models. One of them is to use, uh, uh, functionally use circuit breakers, much like we use with AC, but they aren't they aren't like AC circuit breakers, they're uh, usually like hybrid type breakers. What they are is that you use solid state electronics to turn the power off, and then you open up a mechanical switch after the power's already been turned off. My view is that, is I don't know if that's a very favorable way of doing business because I think that's gonna cut, that doesn't help you in your cost equation. Those circuit breakers are gonna be expensive. The other alternative way is to use uh, an understanding, uh, is, is to use things like the multifunction monitor, sense your system, and when you have a fault, you turn, off the you turn off the main bus, you turn off all the power, open up a bunch of switches that are, that are not capable of interrupting fault current, and then turn the power back on. But that only works if you have energy storage within the zone, to hold up the loads while you're doing that. And you don't need very long to go do that isolation. You can do that in less than 100 milliseconds. So I only need about 100 milliseconds of hold up time downstream, which isn't a lot. I think that will get us on the right side of the cost curve, but no one has actually demonstrated that yet. So that's, you gotta get to the right side of the cost curve. So the that first device that goes downstream is uh, I don't know what the right name of it is. This is taken from an older document that we called it a PCM1A. The, if you actually look at the DDG1000 architecture, they have a PCM1, which sort of does the same thing. But uh, this also follows uh, the architecture that's described within that uh, IEEE 1826. So essentially, what it is, it's a modular cabinet, if you want to call that, much like switchgear, that has a bunch of input modules, an internal DC bus, and a bunch of output modules, and some energy storage associated with it. And if you tie it in with that other, that uh, fault detection localization isolation method where you take down the bus, that energy storage module helps you 
hold up the bus, hold, hold up all your loads downstream while you're, uh, while you're trying to fix, uh, solve your problems on the main uh, medium voltage of the bus. So it's protect, it's provide, it protects the, the bus from in-zone faults, hold up power. You can also add more energy storage if you want to uh, run what's called single engine ops. If you want to in, in, improve your uh, fuel efficiency of your plant, we could operate with one generator and then use the energy storage to have, provide it with enough capacity so that if that generator drops offline, you have enough storage to bring up a second generator and, pro and provide the ship. It can also then provide, one of the other aspects when we talk about the quality of power uh, going to loads and, the, and power continuity, um, there are several sources of things where faults can happen. The most common thing that happens is power continuity is that you lose a generator, trips offline. But as you said, hey, if we solve that by putting energy storage in. Uh, another thing that can happen is your neighbor decides to have a short circuit in, in with you. And so if your neighbor, which is on the load side of it, has a short circuit, you're going to see that same short circuit unless they're electrically far away. So if that happens, is how you can do that is individually is to limit the number of loads that are in parallel. Right now, on board ship, essentially every load is in parallel because there, there's nothing really, in, at least on the downstream side, side of a transformer. And so when you have a problem with one load, they all see it. It's like a fracticide type event until the, the circuit breaker clears it. Okay, and so what we can do here is, is that we can actually provide better, cleaner uh, uh, loads by providing each power, using power electronics to provide individual loads the, the quality of the power that they have. And since the power electronics are doing current limiting all those other aspects, the fact that one load has a problem is not seen by another load. But yet if loads aren't sensitive to that, to those interruptions, short-term interruptions, you can lump them all together. So it, that, that uh, sensitivity of the loads to power interruptions and power quality issues is a term, it's a relatively new term called quality of service that we're using within the power system. And so it's, it's designing the power system to provide the level of reliability that the loads need. And by, by providing different graduations of that, you can make the power system more, more affordable by providing only the level of power quality that you need but at the same time is you are providing what the loads need so they don't have to then lump on UPSs and all the other aspects to get the quality that they require. And th these kinds of architectures lend themselves to being able to go do that. Load centers, even down, as I said, uh, downstream of those power converts, you're still probably gonna lump a lot of the legacy 450 volt and AC loads on board ship, they're not gonna change. I mean, I could say everything's gonna turn DC, but the reality is they aren't. I mean, we're stuck with, we're st the Navy's been trying to get rid of 400 hertz uh, equipment since I think, I don't know. I've, I've seen letters from the 1970s saying, get rid of uh, 400 hertz and we still have 400 hertz on board ship. So it takes a long time for legacy interfaces to go away. Uh, and so we're going to see you know, uh, 60 hertz systems, and you're going to want it anyways, even though, you know, if you actually read the, the really fine print, if you get a magnifying glass, you can almost read in the back of it. This will actually run off of a, a DC, and these are solid state power converters. It'll run off of uh, anything from like 90 volts to 260 volts, and something like 100 to uh, 200 volts DC. Uh, so the load centers, one of the other aspects that we'll, you'll see on here is that uh, things that, that haven't been thought through very well recently is, uh, is casualty power. Uh, the casualty power systems that we uh, use on border ships today were, are, are essentially descendants. They're 1950s variants of World War II systems. Uh, we really, you know, from a design perspective, very few of our ships have really even looked at the recoverability part of survivability. Uh, I think it's going to become more important in the future. And uh, using these systems, there are ways of, of, I think, where we can affordably modernize how we do casualty power to provide us ways that are economical, but provide mechanisms to providing a, a feedback uh, to, to 
uh, provide reliability of our power system while still solving that issue associated with uh, casualty power systems. Okay, compartment level. So survivability is a big issue. The, the hard part, you know, in developing a generic power system is, is that uh, the survivability requirements aren't going to even be determined until we write the requirements for the ship. And so uh, you, gotta, you can't say what, what the requirements are going to be, but you have to have a strategy that, that's scalable to whatever ends up being decided 15, 20 years from now. That's the reason why I talk about things like the recoverability requirements. Right now we don't really do much with them on most ships. Some ships we do. But uh, I have to anticipate that there could be a, 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 a casualty power requirement. Likewise, on a, we call compartment level survivability. We, we don't know what the, what, the need, what the actual requirements are going to be in the future. Zonal survivability basically says, hey, if I, if I get damage in a zone, all the other zones in the ship, none of the loads will even know there was a hit. Okay, that's one level of survivability, and you can go talk about that, and you can design systems based upon that, that statement. Compartment level survivability says, in the zone that got hit, if I've got an important load that survived and is safe to operate, I want to figure out the best uh, way of getting power to it. So it's two different problems, but the issue here is, is that I don't necessarily want to do it immediately. It's part of what we call the restoration of service. There's a three stages of survivability. There's a susceptibility, vulnerability, and recoverability. What happens in a damaged zone is recoverability. I don't have to do it fast, and the problem is I don't want to do it fast, because I really want to do is to figure out whether or not it's safe to operate. And so I may have a fire pump that is perfectly survived the damage event and explosion within that space. But 10 feet on the discharge size, there's a huge gaping hole. So if I turn that fire pump on, I'll just do a good job of flooding the compartment. So yeah, it's more than just being able to provide power to something. It's should I power something? Should I do it? And that's an understanding. It's a, and, and it's what makes it hard to do with a machinery control system remote monitoring is that you've got to remember, a bomb just went off in there. And so I don't know what's still left. And so I think there's going to be a lot of human intervention. There's still going to be a lot of uh, figuring out what can I do. I can, so I don't see this as being an immediate reaction. Everyone wants to talk, but I want to be able to repower it within, you know, uh, 20, you know, within two seconds or 10 seconds. I said, no, <laughs> because you don't want to necessarily do it because you really want to figure out, is it safe to do it? It's been in a compartment that's damaged. Everywhere else in zonal survivability, any zone that's not been damaged, yes, that's it. They should never even know that anyone got hit. Different problem at compartment level survivability. The zone's been hit, ordinance has gone off in it. You gotta go figure out what is safe to re-energize and how you're gonna go do that safely. And I talked about it before about, you know, trying to avoid the, the, the fractal side of one load being able to take out its neighbor, you know, everyone playing friendly. Uh, the IPNC is a, is a physical device that exists today. Uh, there, there's a mill performance standard 32272, uh, L3 actually makes a product to that standard. Uh, and really, what that's just, really, it's a power electronics converter. It's a modular box that you can go through and produce any kind of power you want coming out of it. And uh, what's nice about it is, is that, and we talk about 400 hertz loads, what's happening more and more is we're finding out that it's cheaper uh, than putting a 400 hertz distribution system in like we used to do, is to do point of use conversion. And so this device can act as a point of use conversion device for the 400 hertz, any other legacy loads, anything that's got special power requirements that uh, you, know, you, don't, you wouldn't necessarily otherwise know how to power. But also uninterruptible loads. What's neat about uninterruptible loads, everyone thinks you need an UPS for an uninterruptible load. No, you just need two independent sources of power that, aren't, that are truly independent and a fast way of switching between them too. And this, that's what this device can, can do as well. Power generation modules. So the one thing that's interesting here is that, you know, um, what we're proposing is that traditionally when you hooked up a generator, you had uh, one set of windings coming out of the generator and hooked up to one of the, one of the port server bus. But in DC, you, you're not constrained to that. On an AC side is, is, you, is it would be dangerous to parallel 
two sets of windings, both sets, because you would get circulating currents. Because you couldn't, because you remember, I got to get the, electrically, I got to get the phases to match. And if they aren't exactly the same length of cabling the right impedances, uh, the rotor, they, what's, if it, for one circuit, they're going to match, and the other circuit, they're not going to match. So you're going to end up having problems. We went in, we got rid of all those synchronization requirements when we went to medium voltage DC. So there is no issue associated with having uh, paralleling two separate buses from each generator set. You say, well, why that's important? Why do I care about that? Well, one, one thing it does is that, hey, if you have a fault on one, uh, right now you trip the generator offline and you would, not, you would lose the complete capacity of that generator. Now, if I lose a bus, I still have half the capacity. In fact, I can, you know, the, the, the step low change is half of what it would otherwise be. There's a better chance that that generator set's going to stay online. Another thing is you got the odd generator problem. If I go on an AC system right now with IPS, and I got you know, two huge propulsion motors that I want to power with it, I got two buses I want to independently pr uh, provide power to, and I have three generator sets, how do I hook up the third one? Do I got I, if I put it all in one bus, I got one bus that's rated at two thirds my power and the other one at that one third. And so you run into uh, a lot of uh, architectural gymnastics to try to get the power flows to work right. And, or what you usually do is you take the cheaper way out and I just throw another generator in to make, the, you make it an even number of generators. So usually in an IPS system, an electric drive system, you're constrained to an even number of generators. And that re uh, results in either being oversized or undersized. And so what, by going to this kind of construct where you're, uh, you essentially use a split winding, I can minimize the size of my port and start, but I can re reduce the ampacity of the buses, and I can uh, end up uh, basically fully util utilizing both you know, the generator sets uh, capacities. I can better do the matching. So, it's a, so these are opportunities, but they're only oppor they only matter if you take advantage of them. So you kind of have to understand this, to how to take advantage from a, a naval architectural viewpoint. How do I take advantage of the fact that I'm now meeting voltage DC, I don't care about synchronization, and uh, can I use that in order to cut down the size and weight and cost of my system? Likewise, propulsion motor modules, uh, same thing, I can now, uh, drive, take half the power from one bus, half the power from the other one. You have the cross connect there just for uh, abnormal conditions. But also, in our propulsion motors, why not use contra-rotating? It's, e it's an inner and outer shaft. It's not, and you get a, you know, anywhere from a five to a 15% efficiency boost depending upon which paper you read. Uh, And so, you know, I mean, why wouldn't you do it? <laughs> you know, it's not, it, the complexity that you would have with the mechanical, uh, you know, historically you haven't done it because there's been a lot of complexity with reduction gears. It's not there if you're using a direct drive machine, which you typically segment anyways for reliability. Railgun? You'll see that same kind of architecture where you'll want to probably provide the power from, you know, normally from both buses. And uh, the other big thing that everyone forgets about is that the, it's not just powering the gun. The mount itself has got a lot of power that requirements that it needs. It's, you got to remember that, that, that the barrel on a rail gun is not a lightweight barrel. And so the train and elevation motors, you know, those kind of things are, fairly substantial, so it's a, the mount itself is, is, a, uh, is going to require a, a bit of attention and power associated with it. So standards, uh, we talk, I talked a little bit about before, is that one of the, the key things that's going to have to occur in the next years is the industry itself is going to have to go uh, develop, argue about standards. Uh, I know that's, every, you know, not always the most exciting of topics, and if you've ever been in a standards organization meeting, they can uh, be either incredibly boring, as you're doing, going through a reading session and arguing about uh, where periods and commas should be, or it can be very exciting as you're trying to argue 
about what the meaning of a word is. And, uh, but it's necessary stuff that has to occur very soon for this to happen. Uh, when you, one thing you find out is, is that, you know, my experience in standards meetings has been, I've, I've always learned a lot from it because you try to get the good broad uh, spectrum of the industry, the providers, the users, all in the same room. And, uh, you know, once you actually understand what everyone's talking about, you, know, you understand their concerns and you can really get a, come to a good, uh, a good standard, a good agreement for the, and a general industry-wide understanding of what needs to occur. Um, so basically, you know, what, what's happening right now is, is that, uh, you know, through the work that ONR has funded and some of the other stuff through the Electric Ship Research Development Consortium, there's, there has been a series of standards that have taken us to a base level of, uh, of work that we can build upon. I, I mentioned 1826, there's also 1709, which we talked about here, which establishes uh, medium uh, recommendations for medium voltage DC uh, requirements. It, it, it's probably not, uh, it's, it's probably due for revision. Uh, one thing about standards, you only reflect what you know at the time you wrote it. And so, because these are rapidly evolving uh, uh, areas, uh, these standards, uh, you would expect them, they need to be updated on a regular basis as we learn more and more about it. Um, when, we talk about the, when we talk about what voltages we're operating at, my guess is, is that you know, the sweet spot right now probably is gonna be around 12,000 amps or 12,000 volts, excuse me. Why is that the case? Uh, the easy math is if you look at uh, mechanical connections, things like, we're still gonna have in a steady state uh, mechanical sw uh, switch gear, mechanical switches. A mechanical switch right now, the technology we know, is you can, get, you can connect when it's on, you can handle about 4,000 amps. If you try to go up higher than that, you start to use cooling, you have to start doing exotic things. So if you want to keep costs down, you got to keep bus currents below 4,000 amps. So if you got two buses, 12,000 uh, volts each one's 12,000, you know, 12 times four is 48, 48 megawatts per bus, 98, 96 megawatts total capacity. That's probably going to be about, uh, you know, conservatively what you're going to need or less for the next surface combatant. So I, that's the reason why I think 12,000 is probably about right. Uh, I think where the trend is in terms of where, what the power electronics can handle, uh, we are approaching, it's probably a little high for what power electronics really want to do today. You know, we talk about the silicon carbide and the, and the existing device levels, but they're also, as I said, they're, they're on that, that leading edge of that Moore's Law type improvement of power electronics. They will soon be at that point where they can support the 12,000 volts. So if you were to, you know, three or four years ago, uh, people says you can't do anything better than 6,000 volts. That was, you know, when we started doing 1709, it's like, don't talk to us anything more than 6,000 volts. Now they're saying, yeah, we're almost there at 12,000, but you guys really should be talking about 18,000 or 20,000 volts in the future. Because uh, we think you can get you a cheaper systems then, but let's, right now 12,000 seems to be about what the state of the art is in that sense. And I'm hoping that will be where the state of the industry will be in, in uh, five to 10 years. I could be wrong. Won't be the first time. The other big thing that we argue about, usually people you know, initially t argue about the, uh, the voltage levels, but it's all the other power quality issues that also matter. And uh, we're starting those discussions right now. We're, uh, in fact, uh, probably this summer, we'll be starting uh, projects to develop the mill th standard 1399 section. You know, section 300 is the uh, 60 hertz AC systems for low voltage. We'll, we're looking at probably starting a project to develop the equivalent for uh, DC systems. And so uh, we've started the discussions on what all those other power quality requirements would be and how you do it. Some of the things where you would What's going to be different about this standard, should we actually kick it off, is uh, we'll probably include control interfaces along with it too, which will be new and there'll be plenty of arguments associated with that. So if you're interested in it, we definitely like your, your assistance in 
making that a success. So here's a short laundry list of things that uh, we're going to need your help in uh, figuring out. You know, minor things like system stability. Uh, there's been a lot of work over the years. The nice part about it is that, uh, as I said, uh, I think it's close to 15 years from now that the Electric Ship Research Development Consortium started, and there's been a lot of thought in the academic world on how to do this. But what hasn't happened, it hasn't congealed into a complete mass of a workable system. So, there's, so people have been working parts of it, and what we're trying to do now is to draw a lot of what's been learned together in a way that it can be integrated into a naval solution. You know, prime mover regulation, you know, we talked about the fact that, hey, I don't have to, uh, I don't have to worry about getting a very tight speed regulation on a generator set anymore. Well, how do I take advantage of that? What should my, what should the algorithm be on a, on a speed governor now? It's a, uh, you know, my belief is that, you know, the, uh, some of the newer hybrid automobile markets are probably doing something similar. I don't know what they're doing, but they probably have some of that similar issue that's going on as well. And we talked about the fault detection, localization, and isolation. There's been a lot of people who've been proposing systems, but no one has actually put together a system that really all totally hangs together under all the different uh, conditions and scalability issues that we need to have for a power system. And we talked about systems grounding, magnetic signature. One of the issues you run with magnetic signatures, of course, is, is that any time, uh, you know, uh, because we have two conductors, depending on what our conductors look like, you're gonna create a magnetic field, especially larger currents. In, in a DC field, that can end up magnetizing the, the, the structure. So now you increased your magnetic field. Now, can I counter that with, my, with a better degaussing controls? Or do I need to use coaxial cables? Just you know, minor little details like that have to be thought through. And we've got about 10 years to do it all. So it sounds like a lot of time. It's not. <laughs> so summary. We got a lot of new loads out there that are coming out. We've got a lot of the Navy has expressed the need. We're investing the money in the electric weapons. The Navy is willing to invest the money in making sure the infrastructure is right. Uh, there's been a lot of work been done today. We got to make it. Well, we've got to figure out that path ahead, and we've got to, as an industry, develop all of the infrastructure and the knowledge and that knowledge base to be able to successfully bring it to conclusion. So with that said, any questions? <laughs>